Next, we will hear from his mentor, Dr. Stuart Orkin. Dr. Orkin was awarded the 2022 Canadian Gairdner International Award for the discovery of the molecular mechanisms responsible for the switch from fetal to adult hemoglobin gene expression during human development and translating that knowledge into a novel treatment for hemoglobin disorders, sickle cell disease, and beta thalassemia. Dr. Orkin is a David G. Nathan Distinguished Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School and Dana-Farber Boston Children's Cancer and Blood Disorder Center and an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at Boston Children's. Thanks. Please welcome Dr. Orkin to the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the uh, recognition from the Gardner Foundation and want to also uh, thank the foundation for the wonderful week we've had and congratulate the other laureates uh, for this year. Uh, so one of the challenges we, we like to think about is, is we apply molecular biology is how to use these tools of modern genetics, not only to understand biology, but also uh, to formulate mechanisms uh, of uh, mechanism-based therapies that are aimed at really transformative clinical outcomes. And that's what I'm going to be discussing uh, in the work today. I'll be reviewing. I've had an evolving career in which I've had the good fortune of living through many transformations in biology, uh, such as recombinant DNA cloning came on the scene as I began, also prenatal diagnosis of disease by DNA, positional cloning of disease genes, stem cell biology or regenerative biology, genome-wide association studies, and most recently, genome engineering. And you'll see facets of this in the work I'll describe today. So I've been interested in blood cells for my entire career, where these cells come from, uh, how do they form, how do they go awry in disease, and the context in which we've done much of the work is that of red blood cells. How are they programmed, what goes wrong in disease, and can we do anything about what we learn in terms of therapy? The two major disorders of hemoglobin are, uh, are sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia. This is sickle cell anemia, first coined as the first molecular disease by Linus Pauling in 1949. And then seven years later, Vernon Ingram identified a single amino acid change at position six of the beta chain of hemoglobin. That's the cause of sickle cell disease. And this is a uh, sort of a classical view of beta thalassemia, which is a disorder not of the protein coding region itself, but that of production of beta globin, uh, where uh, one gets this classical phenotype in, in untreated individuals. I should emphasize that these are global uh, disorders with a health burden of increasing magnitude. I think the uh, uh, incidence map that you see on the left uh, resembles a map you've seen previously, actually, of, of uh, childhood deaths. And it's, uh, uh, there are at least 300,000 new births a year of individuals with sickle cell disease, and there are about 75 to 100,000 individuals uh, currently in the United States. Uh, this is really the crux of the biology that, that we focused on over uh, many years now. On the uh, top is chromosome 11, which depicts the beta globin locus, uh, which is more than 60 kilobases in length. We've had the DNA sequence of that for more than 35 years, and none of that DNA sequence actually helped uh, really understand the mechanism of regulation. Uh, what happens during ontogeny is in embryonic life, we express an embryonic gene epsilon during fetal life to the fetal genes, which are the gamma genes that are duplicated, and in adult life, the beta globin gene, uh, which forms beta globin, expressive beta globin, which is one of the components of the tetramer of, of hemoglobin. Uh, the mutations of sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia all are within the adult beta globin gene. 
Uh, and uh, I should mention that as adults, we have about 1% fetal hemoglobin uh, uh, at steady state. Uh, and as you can see, around the time of birth, there's a progressive switch from gamma to beta, which is the so-called hemoglobin switch. Now, in the mid-80s, uh, early 80s, uh, we worked with Hay Kazazian, who recently, unfortunately, passed away, uh, working out the mutations that cause beta thalassemia. And at the time, we thought we'd learn some, uh, something unique about how beta globin is expressed, how red cells form. In fact, we didn't really learn that. What we found that there were many different mutations, but most of these affected generic functions of a gene, uh, such as RNA splicing, uh, nonsense codons, transcription, uh, and they didn't really provide the kind of insights that we were seeking at the time. Uh, this information, however, was very important in terms of establishing prenatal diagnosis of hemoglobin disorders in many centers around the world. And this was probably the first disorder for which we had a complete molecular understanding. In order to get back to hemoglobin F, though, we have to uh, uh, look at some of the early uh, sort of insights. And one of them came from a pediatrician, Janet Watson, in 1948, who noticed that infants who were born with sickle cell disease, at least the genotype, were not sick in the newborn period, but became ill six months or so after birth. And uh, she surmised that this might be due to the elevated fetal hemoglobin they still had before the switch was complete. And in fact, she was correct. Uh, fetal hemoglobin is protective both in thalassemia and in sickle cell disease. And a natural history study uh, at the, done uh, through the NIH many years later showed that individuals with higher fetal hemoglobin on average with sickle cell disease uh, live longer. Uh, besides uh, the fact that increased fetal hemoglobin replaces a beta globin, because the expression is reciprocal of these genes on the chromosome, uh, hemoglobin F has the unique property of also disrupting the polymers that uh, form of the sickle hemoglobin. So it, you get sort of two bangs for the buck. Uh, so the field as a whole has wanted for uh, really essentially my entire career to want to increase that 1% to some, th some therapeutic level of fetal hemoglobin which was uh, estimated to be about 20% per cell. Uh, that's a rough number, but it's uh, somewhere in the ballpark. Uh, we then tried to understand how are globin genes transcribed. And this led us to a transcription factor called GATA1, which was that actually the first hematopoietic transcription factor. And it's the master regulator for red cell gene expression. Every gene in red cells depends on this factor. It's a relatively small protein, uh, and it binds a specific DNA sequence. The problem with GATA1 is it's not stage specific. It's expressed in embryonic, fetal, and adult life. Uh, and therefore, it cannot explain how this switch occurs. And really, the conundrum for quite some time has, has been how, do, how does the locus control region, which is a powerful enhancer for the locus, the whole locus, how does it engage the gamma genes in fetal life, and how is that switched to the beta gene in adult life? What, what proteins control that switch? Well, we've had a long history of study of fetal hemoglobin going back, uh, for example, to Janet Watson in 1948. Uh, many different studies of, of globin genes and globin gene expression uh, as soon as one could begin to clone genes. Uh, but around, uh, I'd say around 2000 or before that, uh, we were in a desert. Uh, we didn't understand what factors regulated fetal hemoglobin, and uh, we were coming up dry. And many of us were actually working on other problems at the time. And then we needed something new. And I love this quote from Marcel Proust, which says, the only real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but having new eyes or new technology. And the new technology that appeared 
was genome-wide association studies, which are studies of common genetic variation and how they correlate with traits or uh, disease across the genome. And there were two studies done, one in the UK and one in Sardinia, and we were fortunate to collaborate with the, uh, those investigators in Sardinia. Uh, basically looking at fetal hemoglobin measurements, the level of fetal hemoglobin in populations, the very low level 1%, sometimes it's a little higher. Uh, and uh, these studies uh, resulted in this so-called Manhattan plot, which is what geneticists who do GWAS call these associations. And uh, since I was born in Manhattan, I put the Empire State Building over the most important gene, which is the new, the new gene at the time, which was B11A on chromosome two. Uh, these studies also identified chromosome six, the MIB gene, which is an oncogene controlling cell differentiation, and the beta globin complex itself, which was not a surprise. Uh, what is a surprise is summing these three genetic contributions accounts for at least 50% of the genetic variation, the level of hemoglobin F, which in these kinds of studies is, uh, is a very large number. The problem in genome-wide association studies is going from three billion uh, bases in the genome uh, to understanding something about what you aim to study in the first place. The first question I want to address though is how important is B7A? I mean, we didn't know whether there were 10 factors, 100 factors, or one factor controlling the split switch. And this experiment is probably the most illustrative in which we use sickle cell mice. These are mice in which the uh, mouse genes are ablated by homologous recombination and human genes have been inserted and expressed uh, relatively normally and they have a sickle mutation. And we interbred these with a, a mouse that had a conditional knockout for BC11A, and we restricted the knockout to the erythroid lineage to avoid any confounding issues of other cell types. And we did, did this express, uh, uh, published this actually in 2011. And the results of this experiment were much, much more striking than we would have guessed, uh, predicted at the time. This is a sickle mouse that has sickle cells. And here's the interbred mouse that has an entirely normal blood smear, normal hematology, has lots of fetal hemoglobin, and it's distributed in all cells. And this level of fetal hemoglobin is above this 20% level I suggested before. Uh, and these mice were perfectly normal and live a, uh, a normal lifespan. So that told us that one gene if we manipulated it, it could be curative, at least in a mouse. The b 11 a protein is a big protein, about 100 kilodaltons. Uh, the business end is over here, uh, which are zinc fingers. They bind DNA and they bind the unique sequence, TGACCA, which had never been identified for a transcription factor previously. But remarkably, it turns out it's in the field promoter and is also the site of mutations, which are very rare mutations, leading to fetal hemoglobin in adult life, suggesting these mutations disrupt the binding of the protein. The proteins are oppressor, therefore the genes are expressed. And these were reported more than 35 years ago, and Francis Collins was actually a postdoc at the time who reported one of these. And these, these were totally unexplained for more than 30 years. So how does this protein work? I don't have time to go into all the details, but basically in the field stage, there's an activator called NFY that binds a gamma promoter and drives expression. And then in adult life, BCL11A is expressed. It's not expressed before the adult uh, stage. It bumps off NFY, evicts it from the promoter, we think uh, structurally, uh, and uh, drives repression. And what's remarkable about this is this action, this switch occurs over a platform of about 30 nucleotides, which is really the major guts of the whole switch process. So the promoter itself has evolved to be the sort of template for the switch. So what about this uh, uh, GWAS? 
I, I told you how the protein works, but I didn't tell you how the genetic variation factors into this. Well, it turns out that the b a gene is a large gene, but the, the SNPs, the genetic variation that correlated with hemoglobin F levels, is actually within a large uh, intron right in the middle of the gene where there are three DNA hypersensitive sites in erythroid cells. Uh, these generally connote regulatory elements. Uh, these are not present in brain and B cells where the gene is also expressed. So that suggests that this was a red cell specific element. And in fact, in transgenic mice, it behaves precisely that way. And we suggested in 2013 that we could use this element, really, as an element for genetic modification because it's absolutely cell-specific. And if we modified, it would have no effects on gene expression of this gene in other tissues. We then went on, once CRISPR uh, actually came on the scene, uh, this was in 2015, uh, so we were early adopters of the CRISPR methodology. Uh, we actually peppered the enhancer region with a series of guides to ask where were the functional components of this enhancer. The enhancer itself is 10 kilobases in length, but we identified actually an Achilles heel. I call it dumb luck. Uh, but it sits at a GATA site. The transcription factor we identified in 1989 is important. And cutting this one site, a single cut, leads to about a two-thirds to three-quarter decrement in expression of B11A. And so that immediately made it obvious that that was the place one needed to use gene editing. So we had gone from the whole genome of, uh, of three billion base pairs down to really one GATA site, which we could exploit therapeutically. Uh, so how could we do that? Well, there were several ways to think about manipulating uh, B11A. Uh, one would be to knock out the gene. That's not a good idea because it's toxic to hematopoietic stem cells and you lose B cells. You could knock it down, and that's actually a trial ongoing at Boston Children's Hospital, but with, led by David Williams, a colleague. But the um, uh, one that's gone the furthest is to edit the b a gene at the enhancer sequences that Achilles heel. Uh, you could also mutate the binding site in the promoter, and that's ongoing uh, as well in clinical trials. What b a is, it's basically a rheostat or thermostat for hemoglobin F. Uh, and the question is, how much do you have to dial it down? Well, nature gives us a, a somewhat of an answer. This is an unfortunate circumstance uh, for uh, individuals who have haploinsufficiency. That is, they have one chromosome in which B11A is either deleted or mutated. Uh, they have a, a um, cognitive deficit, auditory um, a speech deficit, somewhat of an autism-like syndrome, uh, but they have 50% B11A. And the question is, what's their hemoglobin F? Well, the hemoglobin F is about 10 times, 10 to 15 times normal. Uh, so that's essentially approaching the therapeutic range. So the, the bottom line of this is you don't need to dial the expression down tremendously. You can dial it down 50% or a little more, and that's in the therapeutic range. So, what's being, so what, how do you approach this genetically now? And this is the current state of gene therapy of blood disorders. Uh, in which one takes hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, modifies them ex vivo, so it's done in the laboratory. It's then these modified cells are introduced back to individuals, the patient whose bone marrow has been conditioned, it's been destroyed by chemotherapy, and then the new cells reconstitute the hematopoietic system. Uh, there are many f facets, that, parameters are important in this. I don't have time to describe them, but I just want to emphasize that every one of them is important in carrying out a successful gene therapy trial. So what is the current state of what's being done? Uh, is, uh, it's to take advantage of the Achilles heel in this 10 kilobase enhancer and make a single cut at that GATA site, uh, disrupt two-thirds or so of the activity of this enhancer, and this single cut impairs b a expression, relieves repression of fetal globin genes, permitting increased fetal hemoglobin. So how well does this work? 
Uh, this is not our work. This is the work by a collaboration of CRISPR Therapeutics and Vertex Pharmaceuticals that have actually taken a, um, one of the guides from a publication and uh, put it into action in both uh, thalassemia, beta thalassemia, and sickle cell disease. And this was a publication in actually December of 2020, describing the first patients. And you could see in a patient with thalassemia, essentially 100% F. Uh, these are uh, because they can't make beta globin. And in the sickle cell patient, they make about 40% F. And uh, uh, the bottom line is patients are well. They've extended this trial. This is the latest public information with 31 patients with sickle cell disease, all of whom are now uh, uh, free of crises and they're free of any need for transfusion. And these patients are, are uh, probably cured as best we know. And this uh, trial uh, has been submitted, uh, initial submission for FDA approval. So it'll probably be the first um, CRISPR uh, therapy approved for a genetic disease. So uh, we believe the genetic approach has been validated, but this, as, as Drew said earlier, this is an expensive procedure. Uh, it's gonna be one, two million dollars for each procedure and cannot be exported widely to many patients. So what can we do about that? One is to improve preconditioning, make it non-ablative, perhaps with antibodies. That's undergoing um, a study by a number of uh, laboratories. Uh, the other approach is in vivo gene therapy, which Drew Weissman uh, hinted at, possibly combining lipid nanoparticles with gene editing. And I think here the question is, the, it's only going to come down to the efficiency and the scale up, whether it's actually doable. So just to summarize, uh, over the past uh, more than 15 years now, we've gone from uh, really the universe of genome-wide association through to understanding the mechanism of how this switch occurs, which was sort of an enigma for my entire career and then using uh, either gene editing techniques or uh, uh, lentiviral techniques, it's possible now to downregulate B cell A for a therapeutic result. And we think this will uh, have positive impact, obviously, for many individuals. I just want to sort of emphasize also the timeline of this, that we, you know, we started with field even though maybe in 1948, we had a long gap where we didn't know how to bridge that gap, and genetics has sort of gotten us across that now into what we think is uh, anticipated approval of a therapy. I just want to emphasize in closing that this is a global disorder with a real health burden, and really we have to focus in the future on trying to reduce that health burden uh, in order to, to really make um, an impact in disease. I have a few take home messages. One, we understand the uh, switch pretty well, but I think uh, an important point is that really B11A has now been thoroughly validated as a therapeutic target uh, genetically, which I think will um, hopefully stimulate further interest in in vivo gene therapy, using this as a target. Uh, and uh, now that we have a mechanism for the switch, we can think about rational drug design perhaps as an alternative uh, approach. Uh, many individuals have contributed to this. I don't have time to do justice, but I just want to show many who have contributed to this portion of our work. Uh, and then finally, I want to give thanks to my family, my wife Roz, who's here, and daughter and, and uh, grandkids. Thanks very much.